Hey, what is up, everybody? Thanks so much for being here or tuning in online today. If you are new around here, my name is Tucker. I serve as the campus pastor here at the Palmetto Bay campus. And hi, my name is Isaac. I serve here as one of the guest services. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if it is your first time joining us, we want to welcome you, especially wherever you are tuning in from. If it is uh, Doral, if it is Coral Gables downtown, if it is West Kendall, Redland, or Homestead, or you guys are outside here at Palmetto Bay or here in the room, man, we are glad that you guys are joining us. Drop in the chat where you guys are tuning in from, if you might be watching online. And then, hey, I want to also encourage you guys, this is a perfect time to smash that share button and put this thing up on social media or to copy that URL and direct message it to somebody you think needs to be in service or tuning in today, all right? Well, we're in a brand new series right now that we just launched last week, Wrestling With God. Pastor Omar did an amazing job kicking things off last week, but better me tell you about it. Why don't you guys take a quick look at this recap and we'll be right back. Stop comparing yourself to other people. Listen, don't focus on what God is doing in someone else's life and focus on your own journey. Embrace your journey. God apportions everything as He sees fit. Whether it's talents, whether it's abilities, whether it's wealth. Listen, we see from Scripture that all we have, everything we have, ultimately comes from God. Amen? And folks, at times, we can spend our time focusing on somebody else's life and trying to recreate that in our lives. We fall into sinful patterns. We start coveting. We start envying each other. We start becoming bitter because you say, why do they get that and I don't get that? Every time you start comparing your life to someone else's, what it does is that it steals the joy of what God is doing in your own life. So, so good. Amen? Yeah, so good. Incredible, incredible message. And man, if you ever want to catch that message again or any of our other messages, you can always go to cfmiami.org slash sermons. You can see literally every message that we've ever All preached here. Like from now from now back to eternity or whatever. It's, it's a fantastic resource. But another great resource that I always love to share with you guys is prayer. You guys can scan the QR code on the screen and submit your prayer request. Whether the big things or small things, right? praises or prayer requests. We are here for all of it. We want to be lifting you guys up uh, throughout the week. And so I want to encourage you guys to do that right now. All right. Well, we, we've got Isaac with us today. Isaac, if you don't know, he is a Miami man. This man knows our city very well. And so I'm hoping that, that he's going to help some of us experience a little bit of Miami that maybe we haven't experienced before. So Isaac, I'm just going to kind of quiz you, interview you on some of your favorites around Miami. All right, let's might, do it. Might be a blessing to all of us. So uh, first one, I, I'm a foodie, so I got to start here. Me too. Best place to eat in Miami. Right now at this moment, I'm a very big Italian guy. So I would say Fatelli Milano, right in, down, in the heart of downtown Miami. Oh. You hear that? That man put all of the Italian accent on that. <laughs> what, what, what's your go-to dish? What, what do you get when you go there? Well, right now it's um, fettuccine alfredo with chicken. I can't get all fettuccine alfredo, prego. <laughs> I'm like fettuccine alfredo. This man is amazing. <laughs> all right, uh, number two, um, best thing to do on a Saturday in Miami. Best thing to do on a Saturday night or evening, I would say um, Frost Museum in downtown. Okay. And you have the PAM right next to it and Art Center. Let's so all go. those three locations, you can bring all your family together. Yeah. My family, we we we, we go and we take our kiddos over there. Declan loves that joint. Man, the, the aquarium in there. The big circle aquarium. Oh my gosh, the circle aquarium. Yeah. And then like you go down the different layers and that. You can get lost. It's super... No, you won't get lost. <laughs> it's fine. They got lots of help there. But it's an incredible, incredible spot. Okay. How about this one? Um, Miami's a massive city, right? Millions of people, lots going on, but it's easy to lose yourself in this city. It's easy to, to feel like you're just like uh, another fish in the sea. How do you, how do you deal with community? How do, how do you not get lost within Miami? I say small groups. Okay. Small groups right here in our church in CF. I have my, my own small groups in our marriage group. Yeah. We come together. We come together as a team. We yeah. become friends. Yeah. We've been together already. I think it's going to be um, almost a year yeah. of being a small group, married small group. So I think it's great. And I love you it. you come and you serve here together. Come on. I love that. That's incredible. You know, we actually just had Connect to Others weekend last weekend. Over 300 people signed up to get into a small group. And shameless plug, if you missed that and you didn't get into a group, see it miami.org slash groups and you can get plugged into a group this week all right well guys service is about to start we're gonna throw it over to the countdown and then i'm gonna see you guys again very soon see you
Welcome to Christ Fellowship. Let's stand together. Let's get ready to lift our voices because our God is present in every battle. He's faithful in every promise and we can trust him. He's worthy of our praise today. So let's sing, come on. For every battle you've won without question, for every lie that you silence or love, we acknowledge you in every victory, Almighty oh, God. For every promise you kept in the past, for every burden you lifted with ease, we have gathered with great expectation. Still, when try. 
foundation of the world rose victorious for you and for me. Come on and give him some praise today. Yo, what is up, everybody? How y'all feeling? Amazing. Hey, you guys can have a seat. And what is up to everybody tuning in online right now? So glad to have you guys joining us today. If you are new around here, my name is Tucker. I serve as one of the pastors here at the Palmetto Bay campus. And man, if it is your first time with us, we want this to be a place that you feel like you belong to, not just show up to. And the easiest way to start that process is by filling out a connection card. Very simple. Scan the QR code on the screen right there behind me or on the seat right there in front of you. Fill out that connection card. Our team will follow up with you this week to help you find home and community right here at CF. And then on your way out the door after service, swing by our Next Steps tent. We have a free gift. Somebody say free free gift waiting for you there. And then for my friends online, we didn't forget about you. We have a free gift for you as well. If you go to cfmiami.org slash connect, fill out the same connection card, we will email you a free gift also, all right? Well, if it is your first time, I want you to know right up front that we exist to help you and your entire family follow Jesus. We got Sea of Kids happening right now for birth through fifth graders. That's why every Tuesday we've got a spot for our young adults, 18 to 29 year olds, to grow in their walk with Jesus. And then every Wednesday we've got a spot for your middle and high schoolers uh, to grow in their walk with Jesus as well. Also on Wednesday is family night. We've got small groups for the adults. We've got childcare provided for the little kiddos. We've got it all right there on Wednesdays for you. And so we want to encourage you guys to get plugged in wherever fits your life and your family and your rhythm, all right? Well, Speaking of getting plugged in, we came out of the pandemic. Most of us got plugged in. Some of us struggled a little bit more, like the King family. Why don't you take a look at their story? I used to be an addict, and, you know, praise God, I've been 10 years sober this year. But it was all with God's Word and growing, not just in His Word, but with the people I surrounded myself around. I came to CF. And when I saw Pastor Omar's vision, I knew that that's what I wanted to be a part of. I uh, started coming to CF actually through my wife. Um, uh, we met in 2015, and uh, whenever I would come here, you know, she would take me to the church, to, to CF, and uh, you know, it always felt like 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 home. Family nights for us was really cool because Hannah's going to be six and we have never been able to really join into a couples group because childcare has always been, you know, an issue. So um, when we heard family night, we're like, we're doing this. And I feel like now that we started with the family nights, like I'm getting to know more the people that I see every week and I serve with and I do Bible study with in a more personal level. And we've been blessed by it, you know, uh, on a personal level, um, uh, you know, it, it kind of rekindled, you know, uh, that spark for me to dive into the Word, you know, being a dad, being a father, a husband, you know, to really take that role and to lead, provide and protect. Before we used to take turns, you know, especially with Bible study, you know, I would go one week and then she would go the week after. Now that we have childcare, it's a huge blessing because that consistency is there every week. Yeah, I think the, the great thing about the Family Night is that there's a group for everybody. And within the groups, you get to hear other people's testimonies as well. And that helps me personally, you know, to grow, to know and see how God is at work in somebody's life and it fuels me to keep walking in the Lord's ways. Come on, can we praise God for what he's doing in the King family's life? I gotta tell you, that, that story, it ministers to my soul because as, as our team was planning and preparing and praying over launching into these Wednesday family nights, this is exactly what we were praying for that an entire family would be served in a single night, that, that we would be able to create an environment where uh, adults could, could, could grow in their walk with Jesus without having to worry about childcare and their kiddo could be taken care of in a safe environment because how many of us know we live in Miami and finding a good babysitter is hard and expensive. And so we're just so grateful for, for what God has been doing these, these last couple of months as we launched into these Wednesday family nights. And I want to tell you guys thank you because whether you realize it or not, you are a part of Wednesday family nights. And I don't mean that all of us are serving in Sea of Kids or Sea of Students or, or leading a small group or whatever, but through your generosity, we are able to have Wednesday family night. Without your faithful giving, we couldn't, we couldn't support these three different ministries on Wednesday nights. And so I simply wanna just tell you guys from the bottom of my heart as a pastor, thank you. 
And God bless you guys as you continue to give, or maybe for some of us, you're gonna give for the first time today. And I wanna celebrate you taking that step of faith in your journey with Jesus. To do it, all you gotta do is scan the QR code on the screen behind me or on the seat right there in front of you. You can even set up a recurring gift so it comes out automatically. I know how it is. We wanna be faithful in this area, but sometimes we forget about it and that makes it simple. For my friends online, you guys can go to cfmiami.org slash give and do the exact same thing. Or if you happen to have cash or checks, you guys can put those in the giving envelopes and drop them in the give boxes on your way out. All right, let's pray. Jesus, you've done incredible things already and we pray that you would use these tithes and these offerings to do many more incredible things on Wednesday family nights. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Hey, let's stand together as we continue to sing and worship. Let's pray. God, we fix our eyes on you. Would we be reminded, Lord, that you are so, so good. We come exactly as we are to your presence now. Let's sing, church. Can't go back. Can't go back to the beginning. can control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be.
that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. Do you believe that the Lord is in this place at all campuses? Come on, let him hear it. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, welcome, Christ Fellowship. So great to see you. Another beautiful day to worship our great God. My name is Omar, and I serve as a lead pastor here at Christ Fellowship. And I want to welcome everyone right now uh, joining us live stream online as well as our local campuses all across Miami. It's a blessing to be able to worship and study God's Word together across all campuses, all the way up from Doral to Coral Gables to West Kendall, the Redland Homestead area, and here at Palmetto Bay. Come on, let's give our first time guest one warm welcome. And if it's your first time here, listen, it's a great week to be here. We are continuing a series called Wrestling with God. You know, at times we feel in our walk with the Lord, it feels like we are wrestling with God in many ways. You know, last week we learned about wrestling with our, the concept of our future, right, our destiny. Today we're going to be learning about how to wrestle with temptation. Yeah, I think all of us, right, it's applicable for all of us. And so, man, I am ready and excited to dive into God's Word. I hope you are as well. And so wherever you find yourself, let's open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. And uh, you can follow along with me as I read, all right? Listen to what God's Word says. Now, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau, his brother, came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. So Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? So Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau, what church family? Despised. What is it? Despised. Despised his birthright. In other words, Esau was tempted with a choice. Either to satisfy that temporal need, a temporal hunger, or enjoy the lasting birthright, the lasting spiritual blessings of God. That is God's word. You can go into a seat, everybody, at all campuses. And folks, let me start off by sharing this with you. You know, last week I shared with you all that Ashley and I, for our anniversary, went, we went to Colorado. And in the home that we stayed in was pretty remote. And what was really cool about it was that there was a lot of wildlife around. Now, kid you not, there were like 30 deer around us the entire time. Uh, at night, there were some mountain lions, which I got to admit was a little scary, a little, a little nerve-wracking. And there was trout and ponds. It was a really, really cool thing to see. And folks, I started researching, and I realized that in the Colorado wildlife, they were about to introduce wolves back into the wild. And folks, that was to restore a, a balance in nature. But folks, here's the thing. There are times that wolves do not need to be introduced into the wildlife, quite the opposite. They have to be eradicated. And folks, not only to, to preserve a proper a balance in nature, but folks, more importantly, to keep children safe from hungry wolves that could prey on them in the evening. And so, and, and so the reality was that the way they do that is through what they call, obviously, traps. Now, Follow me here because one of the most famous traps, wolf traps, ever recorded was, were, were by the Eskimo people. And folks, it was a strategy that was both deceptive and deadly. And folks, here's what they would do. Here's the sequence of what they would do with these traps. Now, bear with me. It's a little gruesome, all right? But just follow along with me, all right? So here's what they would do. The Eskimo would grab a large knife the biggest it can find, and he will make the blade as, as sharp as possible. And for the first step was that he would cover that knife in blood, in animal blood. And then he would allow it to dry. Then, once it was dry, he would cover it again in animal blood and let it dry. 
and then again and again until the entire blade was covered in frozen animal blood. So you could not see the blade. And so once that was done, he would go out in the middle of the day to that path, to that area where he knows uh, the, the wolves were frequent. So he would get in the ground, he would stick the knife into the ground with the, with the blade part looking up. It almost looks like a little block of blood ice. And so here's what would take place. In the middle of the night, as the wolves would be traveling, they would obviously notice something on the ground. And folks, even though it was not something that they were used to, right? They were used to hunting. They were used to preying on a dead animal. At that juncture, the wolf had a choice. Everyone say choice. choice. Everyone say jo choice. choice. Yeah, he had a choice. Whether to ignore it and keep walking or to begin to engage in it, into that trap. And folks, once he began, the, the, the wolf begins to engage on, in that trap, he begins to lick the blood uh, uh, all through the night. Here's what happens. By the time that he finishes licking all of that icy blood, here's what happens. His tongue is already numb, so he cannot uh, feel the sting of the blade. And now the blood that he's tasting is not the animal blood. Folks, it's his own blood. And folks, as he keeps doing that throughout the night, eventually he bleeds to death and is found dead in the snow. Now, I told you it was a little gruesome. Folks, let me just bring that over to our teaching for today because what an example of how sin tempts us and traps us. And by that I mean that just like the wolf gave into the temptation and thereby lost everything, just like that. And here's the main idea as we open up God's word today. Listen, sin has a way of tempting us or baiting us with some sort of temporary pleasure, with some sort of temporary uh, satisfaction or, 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 or need. And here's the thing, at that, at that moment, listen, we all have a choice either to give in, either to, to walk away from that temptation, right, or to give in into that trap, into that temptation. And family, here's what we need to understand. Once we give into that trap, once we give into that temptation, folks, it keeps us there. It keeps us there. And the longer that we stay engaged in that sin, not only does it begin to harm us, it begins to harm everyone around us. And folks, if we stay there long enough, we could lose everything, even our very lives. And who knows, maybe you're here right now sitting and you're thinking, Omar, listen, man, I'm tracking with you because there are times that I see myself falling into temptation. And, and, and Omar, it's like a trap. And, and I get stuck in there, and the longer that I'm in, I see myself how it begins to affect me. Maybe for you the trap is, uh, is, is lust. Maybe for you it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's bitterness. Perhaps it's greed. You want to keep all, that, all the money for yourself. Never be generous. Never do anything for the gospel. Maybe it's gossiping. And so what happens is once we engage and these temptations, not only does it affect us, we get hurt, it starts hurting people around us, but folks, it starts impacting our very lives, amen? amen. You're thinking, Omar, I, I want to honor God. I, I, I want to live the life that honor God. So Omar, what do we need to know when we are faced with that choice, when we are faced with that temptation, what do we need to know in order not to engage and just keep moving on? Well, folks, we're going to find out today from an ancient story in Genesis chapter 25 of two brothers, Jacob and Esau, all right? So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Genesis chapter 25. You can follow along in our listening guides as well as in our app. And folks, today I have two important thoughts for us about temptation. Christ Fellowship at all campuses, let me hear you. Are you all ready to dive into God's Word? Let me hear you. Yeah. All right. So write this down as point number one. Here's the first thing we need to know. That is this. The wrestling with temptation 
is the greatest fight of your life. Now, folks, listen to what God's word has to say. It says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was what? Exhausted. Stop right there and slip into the scene. Because as you can tell, the twin boys, the twin baby boys that we learned about last week, by now they are grown men. And as you can tell, Jacob was more of an indoors man, more uh, a sophisticated man, while Esau was that rugged outdoorsman who loved to hunt. And so as we just read, right, the mother, Rebecca, was a little closer to Jacob while Isaac was closer to Esau, why? Because they shared that passion for hunting and so they had that in common. And so one day, Esau came back from a hunting trip and folks, he was exhausted and he was hungry. And so listen to what happens next. It says, and Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom sounds like red in the Hebrew. So Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Now, here's what's happening. Esau here is tempted with a choice. And and that's either to satisfy an immediate need, right? In this case was his hunger. Or to enjoy his birthright for the rest of his life. Now, for us in modern day, birth, the, the concept of a birthright sounds like it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. But folks, in this context, it was extremely significant. Because folks, not only were there some significant spiritual blessings that came as the firstborn, but also the firstborn was to receive twice the amount of inheritance as all the other brothers. So for example, in Deuteronomy 21, listen to what it says. It says that a father shall acknowledge the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So notice Esau being the firstborn twin, remember he was born first, he was in line to receive, get this, twice as much as Jacob. In addition, he was going to receive a special spiritual blessing that would come from his father, Isaac, for the future. So here, Jacob is being a little sneaky, right? He's a deceiver, and he's trying to capitalize on this situation by tempting him with some stew. Now, that must have been some good stew, right? And so, folks, even though, right, this story may seem kind of insignificant, almost like kind of odd if you think about it, this is what this moment in biblical history is going to show us. In fact, write this down as letter A, that the insanity of sin is despising eternal joy for temporary pleasure. Now, listen to what happens next. He says, Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentils too, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau, what church? Despised his birthright. So what do we see here? Esau, at that moment, was craving this do so much that he forfeited, he sold his birthright. Again, folks, it's not even the wealth aspect of it, but he forsook the spiritual blessing of his father regarding the spiritual things of God. Which, by the way, you're going to be back next week because next week we're going to be be looking at that moment where these blessings were given. So you're going to be back for that. But folks, here's what I want to point out to us. What is sad is that the decision was made by Esau in an instant without a thought. In fact, the great theologian um, 
John Owen, uh, who wrote The Mortification of Sin, an old little book with, regarded as one of the best books about sin and temptation, he once said this, John Owen, he said this. He said, Esau gave little thought that when he sold his inheritance, he had completely forfeited God's eternal what? Blessing. Blessing. And folks, this, don't miss this, this is the insanity of sin. It's whenever in our life we look at something which value is temporal, which value is, which pleasure is trivial, and without much thought, listen, we choose it over the greater blessings of God. Folks, this is what happened from the very beginning. You know, when you look at Adam and Eve, when Eve decided to choose a bite of fruit instead of an eternal relationship with God. Esau, Adam followed, we all followed. Esau eventually inherited that madness, that insanity of sin, and he gave up for a bite of stew the eternal blessings of God. And folks, listen, we inherited that from, from them as well, amen? Here's the reality, listen, for a quick moment of passion, we destroy our marriages. For a quick moment of anger, giving into anger, we hurt those we love. For a quick moment of lying, of deceiving, listen, we forfeit our integrity, we forfeit who we are. And so here's a question that I wanna pose for us. I wanna give us a statement, and I want you to fill in this blank honestly when you read it. Here it is. In your life, listen, I am despising the blessing of God for the momentary pleasure of what? Just think about it in your own life. I am despising God's blessing in an area of my life because I'm giving in to the momentary pleasure of what? For some of us, it's lust. For some of us, it's unforgiveness. For some of us, it's bitter. Is bitterness, is anger. For some of us, it could be greed. We hold in all the blessings of God. We're not generous to others or the things of God, so we hold it in. You see, what you need to understand is whenever you despise the Lord, the, you know, when you, whenever you choose that momentary pleasure, you're despising God's blessing in your life in that specific area. And folks, what makes it worse is this, write this down, let it be, that despising the blessings of God always leads to more sin. You know, I always like to remind you that Scripture's best commentary, it's Scripture itself. And so if you fast forward from the book of Genesis to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, listen to what the book of Hebrews in the New Testament has to say about this ancient story. It says this. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single what? For a single meal. Now, you may be sitting right now watching online or maybe watching at one of our campuses and you're probably thinking, wait, wait a second, Omar. I, I, I thought, where does sexual immorality and ungodliness come, come from? I just thought Esau just, just picked stew over his birthright. Well, here's what happens. It's a slippery slope. Right after this, in the next several chapters, we see that Jacob... Uh, goes off and he goes off to a land to find a godly woman to be his wife. When Esau, in order to despise not only his parents, but, even, but ultimately God, began to violate God's divine command, he began to intermarry 
with a bunch of the women, the Canaanite women, women of the land who were ungodly, who were idol worshipers. And, 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 and so he became more and more sexually more. In fact, Jewish tradition holds that Esau throughout his life became more ungodly and way more sexually immoral than that. And so what we see here in, in, in Esau's life is that despising that God's blessing led him down the path towards sexual immorality. Now, let me take a moment to address sexual sin because it's what it led Esau to engage in. You know, sexual sin in today's culture is oftentimes, it's always minimized, and oftentimes it is celebrated, right? You look at movies, you look at TV shows, you look at their phones, right? It's oftentimes celebrated. When we look at God's word, sexual sin is one of those sins that God warns us can grab us and take a hold of our heart like nothing else. In fact, God's word says this. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Everyone say flee. Flee. Everyone say flee. flee. Yeah, flee from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits, it's outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, you are not your own. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price at the cross. So glorify God in your body. You know, the word sexual immorality there, listen carefully. It means any sort of sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. So that includes premarital sex. Uh, that includes living together. That includes uh, pornography. That includes adultery once you're married. Uh, that includes homosexual, uh, uh, homosexual sexual actions. So basically any sexual activity outside of God's blessed design for marriage. And family, my my fear is that some of us may may be engaging in some of these sexual sins. And in our mind, we are minimizing, right, because culture says it's fine. Your buddies at work, your your, your friends at school say it's perfectly fine. They celebrate it. Or you know it's wrong, but somewhere along the line you think, well, God understands me. And so he's giving me a pass for this sin. It's not really affecting me much. And folks, listen carefully. You're not only at this juncture living a life that dishonors God, but you're allowing this sin to take a grip of your soul, of your heart, in a way you can never even imagine. In fact, listen carefully. Sex is is God's gift to a husband and a wife and it's to be enjoyed in the covenant of a, of a relationship, of, of the relationship of marriage. But if you keep going down this path, listen, you're not only going to forsake God's blessings when it comes to your romantic life, but listen, you're allowing this sin to take deep root in your heart, again, in a way you never even dreamed of. And so this is why God's word says, flee. Flee sexual immorality. And listen up, students. Listen up, young adults. Listen up, singles who are young. You know, oftentimes, young adults say, oh, you know, Omar, what is God's plan for my life? You know, you're early on. You're trying to figure out what's God's plan for your life. You want to know God's plan for your life? Listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. You becoming more like Christ. And then notice what it says, that you obtain from sexual immorality, that each one of us, of you, know how to control his body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, who do not know God. For God has not called us, for God has not called you, me, 
for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man. He don't disregard Pastor Omar. You disregard who? God. He, he who gives his Holy Spirit to you. You know, when I was in my teenage years, I made a commitment to God to wait until marriage to have sexual relationships, relations. And by the grace of God, which is always by the grace of God, uh, I was able to wait. In fact, when Ashley and I started dating, we both made a commitment that we were not going to sin in that area and we were going to wait and enjoy the blessings of God in the context of a marriage. And by the grace of God, we were able to do this. So, and the reason I say that to you is because, listen, God wants the best for you. He doesn't want to steal your joy. He wants you to enjoy the fullest, the blessings that he has from you. So, so listen, if you right now are struggling with this, listen, so it's, it's okay. But listen, what's not okay is just to keep on. There has to be a moment you say, you know what? I, I'm no long, I'm going to get out of this trap and I'm going to move forward in purity because I want to honor the Lord from here on out and I want to experience the blessings of God according to his will. Because listen, God, what God wants for you is much greater than the momentary pleasure that you're giving yourself into. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah. So folks, going back to the story, what we are going to learn is that sin not only leads you to more sin, but worse, write this down as letter C, despising God's blessing can lead you to a point of no return. In fact, listen to what the passage in Hebrews goes on to say. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And, here, and notice carefully what it says now. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, we're going to learn about this next week. When he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Listen, we should not think that Esau's forgiveness and restoration were an absolute impossibility. Instead, Esau's action shows us that he never truly understood the gravity of his sin, and he never came to true repentance. And here's, here's the reason. You all ready? Yeah, guess what? Because Esau was sorry that he lost the blessings of God, but he was not sorry that he lost the God of the blessing. See, Esau was sorry, was sorrowful, because he missed out on all the blessings, but he was not sorry that he sinned against God. In fact, and, and folks, folks, for so many people, that's exactly what plagues so many people in today's society. People are sorrowful when they experience the consequence of sin. Why? Sin always leads to sorrow. But so many people are not sorry against the God who they sin against. <laughs> they just don't like the consequences of sin. And so don't miss this because before coming to know Christ as Savior, sorrow has a, uh, uh, is a tool in your life. You see, sorrow can either lead a person to God or sorrow can lead a person away from God. In fact, listen to what God's Word says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It says, for godly grief, godly sorrow, produces a repentance that leads to what? Salvation. Yeah, to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces what? Death. Death. You see, when a person is grieving over their sin, it could either lead them to Christ to find forgiveness, or it could lead them away from God, and they get further and further away from God, and that's what happened to Esau. And folks, here's the reality. There is a point where God's word says 
that God gave them up, that God gives people up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. See, folks, there is a moment in time that God is convicting, but that God at times, he will stop convicting and let you go on and deeper and deeper into your sin. Folks, that's what happened here. Now, when we all read the story of Esau, let me warn you, because for so many of us, when we're reading and listening to this story, we can almost get prideful. We can almost look down at Esau like, what a foolish man Esau was. Stew? For, and giving up his birthright? And so it's easy for us to look down and pride down at Esau, but listen carefully. If you think about it, we're all types of Esau. You see, apart from God's grace, we're all cursed with the madness of Esau. Listen, we're all sinners who choose one bite of stew and reject God apart from Christ. Isn't that right? And so the reality is that in our sin, we're apart from Christ. Listen, we are without hope. We are stuck in this insanity of sin in the madness of Esau that eventually came from Adam and Eve. So in our sin, listen, we are without hope. But you all ready for the Good News Christ Fellowship? Yeah? Write this down as big number two. Jesus wrestled with temptation and he overcame it. One person agrees with that. Come on, let's praise God for that. In fact, listen to what God's word says. It says, look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated now at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, we see that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. While Esau could not endure the temptation of a stew and forsook everything. In fact, when you look at the book of Hebrews, uh, when you read it in the original Greek text, there is a very striking similarity between Jesus and Esau. In fact, when you read it in the English, you get the sense of it. I want to show you visually to see the, the parallel structure here. For example, Esau, it says, who for a single meal sold his birthright, Jesus, our Lord, Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. You see the similarities here? And folks, here is why this parallel is so important. Write this down as letter A. Because listen, Jesus modeled for us how to overcome temptation. You see, Jesus understood that the promises of God were greater than the promises of sin. You know, a few weeks ago, I shared with you uh, an, an, an analogy that I think may help us understand of how the enemy tempts us, right? You know, when the enemy comes to your life with, with a certain temptation, whatever the case may be, he always comes like this. Remember? He always comes like this. And in one hand, he's going to show you that momentary pleasure, that momentary relief. Whatever the case may be, he's going to show you with one hand that momentary pleasure. But you know what the enemy will never do? The enemy will always keep behind the cost, the consequences of that sin. Because if he were to show you side by side the pleasure of that sin and the consequence of that sin, listen, the consequence of the sin is always far more greater than the momentary pleasure. But when our good Lord, when he comes to us, listen, he will always show you the cost of following him. Amen? Amen. But, but why? But he will also, unlike the enemy, will show you the blessings of God. Why? Because the blessings for obedience far outweigh the cost of following him. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> and folks, Jesus did more than just modeling. Write this down as letter B. Jesus made a way out of the insanity of sin. This is why God's word says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on that cross, that we might 
die to what? To sin. And to live to what? To righteousness. By his wounds you have been what, church? Healed. You have been healed. Folks, what are we healing from what? Folks, healing from the insanity of sin. You see, what, our, what we need, what our sinful hearts and minds, what we need to be redeemed is from the madness of Esau, from the folly of sin, where we keep choosing in our lives the temporal and we reject the eternal. You see, and the reality is that at that, at that moment when Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross for us and then resurrected to new life, listen, as he was dying on that cross, he was purchasing for you, listen, a brand new heart, a, a rational mind, a heart that's able to determine the reality of sin and be able to choose righteousness and obey God and honor God and, and, and live in the blessings of God. You see, where Christ, Christ succeeded when, where all of us failed. Why? So that we can be healed and we can live the life that God has envisioned for us. Can we praise God today, today at our campuses? And so folks, let me end with this. Some of you came in today at one of our campuses. Maybe you're watching online. And the reality is as you were listening to Esau's story, you begin to realize that Esau's story is a lot like your story. You see, for all your life, you've been, real you've been realizing that you have been forsaking God for so long in your life, but you've been giving to everything in this world to try to satisfy those desires. That's why you go from relationship to relationship. You go from job to job. You go from a friend, group of friends to group of friends, from lifestyle to lifestyle, from party to party, from hobby to hobby. Guess what? Listen, you're, all you're doing is you're looking at different stews and trying to test it out, but you keep rejecting the God who loves you. There's something in your heart right now as you're sitting here. There's something that says, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I need God in my life. I'm tired. I've tried so much of the world, what the world has to offer me, and it always comes out empty. It always leaves me emptier than when I first started. And I'm tired. And what I need in my life, I want God in my life. I want a relationship with God. I want to be right with God. I, I want to start a journey with God. And you probably wonder, well, Omar, how do you do that? So we've learned here, it's not about sitting in a chair at church. It's not about being a moral person. It's not about doing a ritual or some sort of tradition to make yourself feel a little, a little godly. Or it's nothing like that. The Bible says that those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do you call on the Lord? Very simple. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. See, there has to be a moment that you transfer your trust from all the things of this world and you put them on what Jesus Christ did for you. How he lived the perfect life of obedience so you didn't have to. How he died of sin for you and resurrected to new life. And folks, listen, the Bible says that the moment that you put your trust, that you surrender your life, you repent on God, the Bible says that all those things that you've done in the past that you've been so ashamed of, you're forgiven. He then comes and then brings you close. He adopts you as a son and daughter. You start a personal relationship with God. And here's the best thing about it. From that moment on, listen, you're no longer a creation of God. You are a child of God. And you start a personal relationship with God. And you might stumble at times, but listen, your journey is secure. Now you're on the path to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And now you start a brand new life, a new, ch a new, a new segment of your life, which is completely different from the past. The question is, is, as you're sitting here at one of our campuses, are you going to keep trusting the things of this world? Or is it today that day that you're going to transfer your trust and put your faith and trust in Christ? Just bow our heads for prayer. My Lord, for those of us who are already believers in you, O oh Lord, who've already given our lives to you, Lord, we're thankful, O oh God. 
the Lord, at that cross, you redeemed us from that curse of Esau, from that madness of sin where we now realize the reality of sin and we're able now to pursue righteousness and holiness in our relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for delivering us. But I want to speak to some of us here today with all heads bowed and all eyes closed at all of our campuses. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, that's me. Man, I'm ready. I, I, I need to get right with God. I, I need to start a new relationship with God. I, I want God in my life. We'll say, if that's you, listen, in a few moments, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. And the prayer is not some sort of poem. It's just me helping you to talk to God. So when, you, when I lead you through a prayer, listen, you talk to God. You don't talk to me. I always like to remind you, when you pray, listen, you don't pray this never to me. I'm simply a man. I cannot save you. You pray to the God who loves you and gave his son to die on the cross for you. So if you're ready at all campus, if you feel like, man, that's me, pray this quietly to yourself. Father, today I come before you and realize how much I need you. I'm tired of living a life apart from you. So I come before you, O oh Lord, and I confess all of my sin. And I ask you for forgiveness of my sin. I put my trust in you, O oh Lord. Save me today, Lord. And for the rest of my life, help me to live a life that honors you and brings you glory. Thank you, Father, for saving me today. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. 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 Hey, can you encourage all those who prayed that prayer? Come on, let them hear it. Amen. Listen, man, praise God if you prayed the best decision. But listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to end today as we often do. We're going to sing a song of praise. How can we not sing a song of praise to a great God to end today? So, but here's what I want to ask you to do. If you pray that prayer, something we do here regularly at CF. If you pray that prayer, here's what I want to ask you to do. Take a little courage, but I think it's going to be very impactful for you. In a few moments, we're all going to stand up at all campuses. We're going to stand up, and we're going to worship God. And listen, the focus is going to be on the stage, nowhere else. But if you feel like, man, I pray that prayer today, I'm starting a relationship, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As everyone stand, is, is starting to stand, I'm going to go down those steps right there. I'm going to be right here. And I would love for you to come down here and just meet me here for three reasons. First of all, we'd love to... Just, we'd love to just uh, say hi to you and, and just uh, be able to congratulate you and just to meet you. Second of all, we have a brand new leather Bible free of charge that we want to put in your hand so that you can uh, start reading God's Word. It has a note from me, uh, some next steps for you, so it's really important for you to have this in your hand. And then lastly, we're going to connect you to one of our pastors who are going to help you in your new walk with the Lord and connect you, right? Because it's a new journey, right? So we want to help you take steps in your walk with the Lord. You know, I always share with you that in the Gospels, there's a story of a lady, of a woman, who she was ministered to the Lord. And she tried to rescind into the crowds and no one to see her, but the Lord said, no, come, come. And it was a beautiful moment for her. It was the most important day of her life where she met her Savior and her, the rest of her life was changed. You know, just the first service, we had so many people come up, young and old. It was amazing. And so I'm sure that there's people here today that says, you know what? And I'm ready. I'm ready to start this new journey with the Lord that we would love to celebrate with you. And so can we encourage those who are going to come to the front in a few moments? Yeah? Amen. And can we also agree that we're going to let people pass by that want to come to the front? Can we also agree with that? Yeah? Can you help with that? Yeah? Okay. And so listen, if that's you, the moment we start singing, I'm going to come to the front right here. You just come meet me. It'll be really special, right? So let's go ahead and stand up and let's worship God together. If that's you, we'll love to come down, come up to the front.
on, family. Can we give it up one time big for Jesus? Come on, light heaven, hear your praise. People's lives are being changed today. Amen and amen. Y'all, exciting, exciting times to see people coming and giving their life to Jesus. Maybe you're here, you are already a follower of Jesus, but man, you're just like, I go, I'm going through some stuff. I'd like to pray with somebody. We're gonna have a prayer team up front here after the service. And other than that, man, we love you guys. And we're gonna see you guys back next week as we keep going through this series, Wrestling With God, all right? Love you all.